uh, on maintaining Islamic ethos at university. Uh, just a little bit of background on the thing. Um, Sheikh Rabban Hussain al Asri, he joined Al Karam school in 1999, age 11. He completed his GCSEs five years later and decided to continue his education at Al Karam Higher Islamic Studies Department. Enrolled into the Jariat Nizami course in 2004 and graduated in 2007. Enrolled into the famous Al Azhar University, Cairo, in September 2007 and graduated four years later with a BA honours in Hadith, which is Islamic theology. Uh, he spent an extra year in AUC, which is an American university in Cairo, studying modern translation and spent time in various maktabs in the city. After eight years in Al Qaram and five years in Al Azhar in, in Cairo, uh, he returned to the UK in 2012 and enrolled in the Cambridge Muslim College, where he had the honour of studying under the guidance of one of the luminaries of this Ummah, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Awad. Uh, he graduated from CMC in 2013 and he currently works with many masajids, Muslim organisations, and interfaith groups to promote an understanding of Islam that is not only relevant but worthy of a rich tradition. So that's how they do in China Sheikh Abdul <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al-anbiya wa al-musalim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'ad, fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-Rahim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alif lam mim, thalik al-kitab la rayda fi, hudan lil-muttaqeen, sallatullahi al-azim. اللهم انفعنا بما أنتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما والحمد لله على كل حال. ما دي رسبك للمسلمين والبرد والنزست من الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. First of all, it's an it's an honor, it's a privilege to be here for you today. And after look after finding out this is in fact the mathematics lecture room and seeing math. Equations up on the board. I realise that I'm quite out of my depth, um, but uh, you know, inshallah, we we try to continue. Zakhla Sidi Hassan, that was um, uh, an introduction that wasn't, you know, was was beyond. It's not. I'm not clearly not aware of yet, but it's something that we get. May Allah reward you for it. For so once again, let me uh, congratulate you on a beautiful campus. This is the first time I've actually been to Warwick University, and uh, I'm quite. Uh, surprised seeing your uh, the, the prayer room. I spent a year in Cambridge, in the, which the the students of Cambridge like to call the centre of the uh, uh, education in, in the UK. And um, you know we don't have a the lecture the, the prayer room is a, you know you know quite quite small quite small in fact. Um, so Alhamdulillah, I'd like to congratulate you on that and inviting me here today. I'm I'm deeply honoured. Uh, and you've given me a topic that is quite um, it's a profound topic, maintaining an Islamic ethos at university. And I was talking to some of the brothers just before uh, Maghrib, and we were talking about how difficult it is to maintain an Islamic ethos generally. Uh, and in universities, it's a lot more difficult, it's, it's harder. It's, um, and the first thing that I just want to mention before we commence with the talk is uh, a very pivotal point that I, I, I informed some of the brothers before, that when you start out or you intend to, when you uh, intend to do something, uh, you have to have something which we call in Arabic, ikhlasun niyyah, the sincerity of your intention. Your intention has to be pure. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the first hadith mentioned in Bukhari and Arab, I'm sure many of you have heard this from many of our scholars. Indeed, every action is dependent upon your intention. There's another hadith reported by Sayyidina Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala anhu the Prophet said that the intention of a believer is better than his amal, his action. Um, so when you embark on, 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 on a journey, and this is no doubt a journey, uh, uh, being here at university. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kharaja fi, man kharaja fi talab al-ilmi, kana fi sabeel illahi hatta yarja'a. That, uh, Uthima Qa'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that whoever goes out, man kharaja, whoever goes out in search of knowledge, kana fi sabeel illah. He is in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hatta yarja'a, until he returns. Um, and you have heard of the famous narrations, and this is not a lecture on 
the fadail, the, the importance of knowledge and, and ilm in Islam, that angels spread their wings under the feet of, of, uh, of a talib, of a person who, who, who studies. And in terms of knowledge, knowledge is, people say, oh, well, it's, it's Islamic knowledge. This hadith refers to Islamic knowledge. And uh, it's difficult to differentiate what is Islamic knowledge from that which is not. Uh, the Prophet, the Prophet وسلم, used to make a dua, Allahumma anfa'na bima alamtana. That, oh Allah, uh, that which you uh, have given us, that knowledge that you have given us, Allahumma anfa'na bima alamtana. Make that knowledge benefit us. Wa'alimna ma yanfa'na. And teach us that beneficial knowledge. Wazidna ilma. And increase us in knowledge. Walhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. And all praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all states. And so that knowledge which benefits you, which benefits the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which benefits Islam, that is beneficial, that beneficial knowledge is in fact Islamic knowledge. The first five verses that were ever revealed, Ikra, Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insan, khalaq al-insan min ala, Ikra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi anlama bin qalam. In these first five verses, the, the first verse in itself, Ikra, read, read what? Read, read that which your Lord has given you. Ikra, read. These are the first five verses of the Qur'an, which again tell us the importance of, of knowledge. And that knowledge isn't only knowledge which is related to hadith, or knowledge which is re related to tafsir, or knowledge which is related to fiqh or jurisprudence. It encompasses all that knowledge, which benefits not only you, but the Ummah of Rasulullah wasallam. So someone who's studying to be an engineer, and he hopes that that's going to benefit not only himself, with a nice salary, but also his, the, the Ummah around him, that is... Uh, a beneficial uh, that that can be counted as beneficial knowledge or any other career or form. So the first thing that we have to question ourselves is why are we here? And I'm talking about the students in university. Why are we here? What is our purpose and what do we aim to achieve? The most important question, however, is how are we planning to serve our deen in regards to what we are doing? So what we what we're studying here. How do we plan to further that cause? How do we plan to serve our deen in relation to what we're studying today? And that's the most important question. Um, another important question, which, um, which I believe that we must ponder, and, and, and insan, uh, man, always is one who does tafakkur, who always ponders, uh, is how are we being perceived? And for Muslim students, British Muslim students studying in the 21st century, Great Britain. This is probably one of the most important questions. How are we being perceived? Um, since we're from the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we are no doubt representatives of Islam, we need to be the best representative that we can be. Uh, and in order for us to be the rep best representative, just imagine, take yourself uh, uh, for, or look at it from an eyes of a non -Muslim, from a non-Muslim perspective that if you were a non-Muslim, what would it be about a Muslim that would attract you towards Islam? So what would you look for in a Muslim and think, wow, subhanAllah, is this Islam? SubhanAllah, that's the religion that I'd like to adopt. And that religion is something which, which I'm fond of, which I'm attracted to. So that's the representative that we need to be. We need to understand how important it is for us to be perceived in a manner that is worthy of our rich Islamic heritage, our tradition, uh, is worthy of the, the Qur'an and not worthy of the flawless character and personality that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in order for us to be a good representative, Islam plays a pivotal role. No matter what you believe, Islam plays an important role. Uh, it is, it's your way of life. And it has to manifest in every aspect of your life. Whatever you do, Islam has to be a part of your life. Everything that you do, you walk down the corridor, you see some litter on the floor. You know, it's Islam that allows you, it's Islam that makes you pick up that piece of litter and throw it in, into the bin. The Prophet sallallahu says that, uh, 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 that Iman, faith, is of 77 branches. Uh, and in another narration is 60 branches, 70 branches, 70 branches of faith. And the highest of the branch, afdaluha qawlu la ilaha illallah. The highest branch is to say la ilaha illallah. And there is no God except Allah Azza wa Jal. 
to, uh, and the lowest branch, wa'adna, the, the, the lowest branch or, or one of the branches of faith is imatatul adha an tariq to remove an, a, a, a piece of litter or something that may harm uh, travelers or passerbys from, from the street. Uh, and, and, that's a part, and that's a part of faith. <coughs> Why? Because that's Islam that allows you, it gives you, it enables you to become more considerate to not only, you know, there's this misconception that Muslims are only considerate to other Muslims. No, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa if you look at the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, for 40 years he lived in Makkah al-Mukarrama. And there were no Muslims then, prior to, to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam proclaiming Nabuva. And even when he did proclaim Nabuva at the age of 40, very few people accepted Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived in a time where, again, like us, he was the minority. But however, unlike us, he was a persecuted minority. Islam was a pers Muslims were persecuted at that time. Um, so look at the take from the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whatever you aim to do, whatever you aim to be, whatever you aim to achieve, make sure you you uh, you look within yourselves and you ponder as to whether what is how am I being perceived? You know, is this something that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do? Is this something that the Quran commands me to do? So that's something which is, um, which is pivotal. Uh, one of the reasons why, there's nothing more painful, by the way, than seeing our young brothers and sisters deviate from, from Islam. And by deviation, I'm, I'm sure most of you know what I mean by not adopting uh, Islamic teachings within our own lives. And I don't specifically mean in relation to ibadat and, and prayer and, and salah and giving of zakah. And, and you know, Islam as in a way of life we deviated from that path. We don't. We haven't adopted Islam as our way of life, and it's sad to see that. It really is. Um, you, and with that, you see Muslims losing their identity. You know, we're we're losing our our values, uh, and and well, in, and in some cases, even our deen. I've come across many individuals. Um, I came across a uh, a brother who said to me, and this brother is of a Pakistani background, a Mirpuri background. Are there any Mirpuris here? One, mashallah, a Mirpuri background, and uh, he uh, naturally he had uh, 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 there was a huge emphasis on, on Islam throughout his life, and um, a lot of it was kind of um, by his parents. He he felt as though it was forced upon him, as though he was forced to pray by his parents. He was forced to go to the masjid after school uh, for two hours every single day. He was forced to go to to the masjid uh, during on the weekends. And uh, he was in—he he just graduated um, last year, and I, I met him a couple of, uh, of months ago, uh, before Ramadan, in fact. And I, and I said to him, you know, Ramadan Kareem, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless you. It's the coming of the month of Ramadan, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the companion, used to be eager for the coming of the month of Ramadan. He used to be very happy. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, prior to the coming of the month of Ramadan, he would talk to the Sahaba Ikram and he would dedicate his Friday khutbas informing the companions of, of the sanctity of this month so that they adhere to, to Islamic teachings in regards to it. And I said, Ramadan Kareem, and he said, Ramadan? I said, yeah, I don't fast. Brother, I don't fast. And I said, okay, that's, that's uh, I'm sure it's not the end of the world, the brother doesn't fast. And he said, well, uh, I said, why, why don't you fast? And he says, uh, well, I, well, I don't know, you know, Islam is just, is just one of those things. So one of those things. Islam is not one of those things. Islam is the thing for us. And he said, I don't believe, to be perfectly honest with you, that I don't believe whether there's a God or not. And that shook me to the core. And I was thinking to myself, that here we are, we're bickering inside our masajids, yeah? where, uh, where some of us are celebrating Eid on, on Tuesday, the others are celebrating it on Wednesday. Uh, you know, where we refuse to acknowledge each other, where we are cursing and abusing one another within our masajids, the house of Allah Azza we're abusing and cursing one another, and we're worried about the trivial matters. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned us against getting involved in those small trivial matters, which will cloud our minds, and you know, we, we, we don't look at the wider context. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, uh, my teacher in, in, in Cambridge, he used to always remind us of the manat. He said the manat is very important. And the manat is a context. And that context means if you, the place in which you live, look at the context. 
Everything that you do, it has a context, it has a manat. And he would always remind us of that. And, um, you know, look at those things that we're worried about, those trivial matters, and our brothers and sisters in universities and our brothers and sisters in the wider British Muslim community in the UK are losing their faith. And we're worried about, um, you know, I'm going to celebrate Eid on Tuesday. The other said, no, I'm going to celebrate on Wednesday just because I don't want to follow you. You know, it's, we're, we're involving ourselves in, in trivial pursuit when we should be coming to, together as, as one ummah. The Prophet wasallam always stressed upon the ummah or the unity of that ummah. The Prophet wasallam said, my ummah is like one body, one jasad, one body. If one part of that body is in pain, then the entire body feels that pain. And, you know, that's how we need to feel. And if there's a single Muslim brother or sister of ours who is suffering, um, we, need, we should be feeling that pain for that individual. Because you know why? The Prophet ﷺ felt pain for those individuals. The Prophet ﷺ felt pain for those individuals who are non-Muslims also. The Prophet ﷺ in, in, in Quraysh, um, you know, uh, bef before uh, the, the number of Muslims reached, a certain amount where they, afterwards, where they done tabligh and ta'wa and invited people towards Islam. Whenever he came across any individual who was suffering, he wouldn't question them first. Are you a Muslim? He wouldn't say, are you a Muslim first? If you're a Muslim, then I'll help you. If you're a Muslim, then I'll assist you in any way I can. If you're a non-Muslim, then, you know, then no. You go to your idols in the Kaaba, 360, 360 of them, and ask them for help. No, the Prophet ﷺ was that all-encompassing individual, the character of the Prophet. That's why the Prophet ﷺ is recognized as Al-Qudwat al hasan The Prophet ﷺ had the perfect example, a perfect example, a role model for us to follow. Um, getting back to, and I kind of deviated myself in the talk a bit there, getting back to the topic of, of discussion today, maintaining an Islamic ethos at university, the most important thing uh, which I believe is the atmosphere. And I mentioned that to a few brothers before as well, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere doesn't, the environment, the atmosphere around you is not the place in which you live. So you don't look around and say, oh, well, the situation in Warwick is like this. So this is our atmosphere and this is how we need to behave. The environment is you. Each and every one of you makes up that environment. So that's what you need to be focusing on, you and establishing yourselves a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So maintaining the, the correct atmosphere is the most vital thing for, for a Muslim to do in, 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 univers in, in university. And, um, and that, the atmosphere now is, is, is corrupt. And when we say the atmosphere has become corrupt, what do we mean? We mean we have become corrupt. The atmosphere is us. The Muslims have become corrupt. Why? Because we've deviated from our deen. We've left the teaching of and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and instead uh, adopted uh, the sunnah of those individuals who are leading us astray. And the atmosphere is the most important point. And by atmosphere, I mean uh, your group of, of in, your friends, the people who you associate with, the people you hang around with in university. That is your atmosphere. That is your environment. And that's what you're going to be judged upon. Uh, and in regards to having a good companion, the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which I'm sure many of you have heard, the Prophet ﷺ narrated, the, reported that the, the example of, of a good companion uh, compared to, in comparison with a, a, a bad companion, is, the, is like the example of, of a musk seller and a blacksmith. You know, with a musk seller, a, a musk seller is perfume seller. Uh, with, a perfume seller, even if you don't buy the perfume from that individual, you're just going to benefit from being in that person's company or his presence. That's going to rub off on you. On the other hand, going to a blacksmith, just spending time in the furnace would, would either burn you or burn your clothes. Uh, and, and this is the example of the Prophet ﷺ giving us in regards to what or who is a good companion for you and who is a bad companion. So regardless of whether that individual is telling you or making you or this ideology or this weird understanding that we have of peer pressure something that I don't believe in personally that there is such a thing as, as, as peer pressure um, every individual is responsible for his own actions on the day of judgment 
we cannot stand in the presence of our Lord and say, well, it, it wasn't me, uh, Zaid or, 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 or Amr, uh, Umar, he, he, he made me do it. It was him, he done it, and then I had to. You know, that's not, the, we're going to be questioned about our own actions, and we're responsible for our own actions, each and every one of us. So, when you choose the company that you keep, choose those individuals that are the best of, 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 of the people. The Prophet Ali salatu was salam, and this hadith is just like that. Prophet Ali salatu was salam once said to the Sahaba, Sahaba Ikram, Now, should I not inform you of the best of the best people from amongst you. And Sahaba Ikram naturally eager to learn says, but of course Ya Rasulullah tell us who are those best people from amongst us. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that the best of you are those individuals that when you look at them, Allah, you're reminded of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So they're the individuals that we need to emulate if we're going to emulate somebody other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're the people, that's the company that we need to keep. That those people who you look at, those people who you spend time with, and by spending time with those individuals, you're, you feel as though you're establishing a connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Know that that's the, that's the musk seller that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was referring to in his hadith. When he gave the comparison of a good companion with a with a musk seller, so that's the that's the company that we need to keep. On the other hand, if we have companions who are always leading us astray, you know, if we have companions who are themselves indulging in in, in, in acts which are forbidden in Islam, which are forbidden by the Quran and the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, if we are uh, participating in those acts, you know, we you know we we know. We can judge from that. That's, that's, that's an individual who's taking us away from Islam. That's an individual who's taking me away from the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's your blacksmith right there. He's your blacksmith. He or she, you know, uh, that's the individual that you want to refrain from. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the most important thing, according to me, that you have to have, a, you know, good companions around you, uh, people who... Um, you know, nowadays we have a twisted version of, of, of friendship. Um, I remember when I, I, I was studying in, in, in Cairo and I asked, we had a conversation with some of our brothers and we said, we were talking about friendship and what friendship means. So we were 19 years old, you know, just didn't have anything better to do. Uh, we had just come back from university, we, we, we weren't studying at the time. And we said, you know, we were talking and we were having a dialogue, a discussion about friendship. And he says, you know, friendship to me, one of my friends said, Friendship to me is that individual who, you know, uh, who's got my back and someone who will support me, um, someone who I know. And, and the example that he gave quite literally was that if I got into a fight, I could turn around and that individual be, would be there, standing right there next to me. Uh, that's my friend. And I thought to myself, you know, that, that's our twisted um, understanding of what friendship is. When you talk about friendship, the Prophet sallam, has given us a clear indication when he said that choose those friends who are going who are going to take you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now even when you love somebody, love him solely for what? Love him solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love that individual. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said uh, and reported by Imam Bukhari in his Sahih, um, uh, that none of you can truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So that's the, the connection that you need to have with an individual. Don't think, oh well, if that individual, you know, if I get into a fight and that individual will be there standing there next to me. No. It's, think about your, your establishing your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your friend is helping you in establishing that connection, in, in making that com connection a formidable one, um, uh, then know that, that that individual is somebody who you should associate with. If that individual is not, he's someone who's taking you away from the path of the, that the Quran has, has pointed out for us and the path of the Sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, then know that that individual is your blacksmith and you should refrain from uh, uh, you know, uh, having any contact with that person.
And that doesn't mean that you can't be amicable. I mean, you know, nowadays we come across people who maybe are, um, uh, you know, not the, the our, what our understanding of what we perceive to be uh, a good Muslim, a pious Muslim or Muslimah. And we think to ourselves, astaghfirullah. And we talk about them and we say, look at that individual. You know, you look at him, you go, look at her, she, she does this, or he does that. And, and we degrade them in, in, in such a way. And know that, you know, your job is to bring people together. Your job is to teach people. Your job is to train people. And the Prophet ﷺ has told us in a beautiful way, that invite people towards your Lord with wisdom. And Mawizat al-Hasana literally means to sweet talk. By sweet talking that individual. By talk which is attractive to that individual. If, if, if someone is doing something wrong and I go up to them and say, Ya Akhi, what is this? Astaghfirullah. You know, you're indulging in something which is kufr. You're indulging in disbelief. And you're going to Jahannam. You, do you think that's sweet talk for that individual? Do you think he's going to turn around and say, Astaghfirullah, you know, I'm going to repent straight away. Brother, you're right. No. That individual is going to turn around and say, look, you're weird. I don't want to associate with you. <laughs> he's going to walk off. You know, I don't want to associate. He's just telling me you're going to hell. You know, when, that's not what a Muslim does. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't, didn't go around and pointing fingers at the Quraysh and saying, you're going to Jahannam. Utba, you're going to Jahannam. Umayya, you're going to Jahannam. No. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to save them from Jahannam. And what did he do? He reminded them of Jannah. He told them about Jannah. And he said, this is what Jannah is like. This is what paradise is. And they were attracted to that. They were attracted to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam because of his prophetic qualities, his flawless, impeccable character. You know, um, uh, many of us, we, we now, when we look back and we study the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, we, we find that the Qur'an was something which was magical for the Arabs. It was that book where, when they heard verses of the Qur'an, whether it be Abu Sufyan, whether it be Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, they were mesmerized by it. They'd heard nothing like it before. And they said, this cannot be, this cannot be the Kalam, this cannot be the speech of any man. This is something which is divine. And, and that led them to Islam. However, the most important factor in bringing people to accept Islam was the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Prior to that, because it was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was reading out the Quran to them, and if they didn't trust the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would never have trusted the Quran. It was the impeccable character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, you know uh, inspired them to accept Islam. You know, that's why it was the likes of Abu Jahl and and. Umayyah and others came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, oh, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if you were to split the moon and I could see one half of one side of the mountain, the other half on the other side of the mountain, only then I will accept your faith. Others would say, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you could uproot that tree, and if that tree was to walk towards me, and if that tree was to bear witness that there is one God and you are the messenger of God, only then will I accept Islam. But there were others, the majority were like Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, there is no God but Allah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr accepted Islam unequivocally. Do you know why he accepted Islam unequivocally? Because he had lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa all his life. He knew about the flawless character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He knew the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam was as sadiq and al amin he was the most truthful and most trustworthy individual that they've ever come across. And Abu Bakr said, this individual can never tell a lie. It was as if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Abu Bakr, Kuntu Nabiyyan, that oh Abu Bakr, that I have become a Nabi, I am a Prophet. And it was as if Abu Bakr says, Bala, of course, Ya Rasulullah. You know, that's, it was as if Abu Bakr was expecting the Messenger of, the, of, of Allah to proclaim Nabuwa. Why? Because that was the, the character of, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That um, he inspired people, you know, by merely uh, his personality and the way his conduct with the people. And say that Aisha radiallahu taala anha, Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, 
she was once asked by the companions, uh, like, oh Aisha, what was, what was uh, the conduct? How was the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What was he like? And said that Aisha said it quite beautifully. She, she says, kana khulquhu al-Qur'an. His akhlaat, they were like the Qur'an. You read the Qur'an, and whenever, whatever the Qur'an says, that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do. That's the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's how we need to bring people towards Islam. You know, let's not degrade and defame and, and talk about people and do riba and uh, slander, backbite about our, our, our brothers and sisters. No, let's bring them to Islam. What, how? By adopting the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the way. That's the way. You know, if, if, if people like Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu can have their hearts changed, then surely, you know, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, prior to becoming a, a Muslim and prior to accepting Islam, he was one of the staunch, staunchest enemies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone who wanted na'udhu billah to kill the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. And after accepting Islam, do you know what Umar said? Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, before I accepted Islam, there was no face that I hated more than yours. And now I've accepted Islam, there's no face more beautiful to me than your face. There's nothing, there's no one who's more attractive to me than, than you, Ya Rasulullah. And that's the, the effect that the Prophet ﷺ had on them. That was the effect that the character of Rasulullah ﷺ had upon them. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا The Quran says, in the Messenger of Allah, in the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have a perfect example. Uswatul Hasan. Perfect example. We need not go further and look for other examples when we have the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to follow. Um, so that's one of the most important things in regards to um, maintaining uh, good conduct and good character, having a good character, having good people around you, surrounding yourselves with, uh, with, with people who are um, you know, learned, who are, who are knowledgeable in regards to their deen, people who are practicing their religion, surround yourselves with those people. They should be, that, you know, in, in, in actual fact, that is, that is your path to, to Jannah. That is, that's your path to success because they're the people that you want to emulate. They're the people who are, bring, who are going to, in effect, bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there was once a, I'm telling you this story, I probably shouldn't. Um, there was, uh, we, when I, we were studying in Cairo, we had a great many laughs when we were there. Um, there, were, there was this one individual who used to have the Azhari, this is the Azhari hat. Um, he used to always wear the Azhari hat and he had this gel. Always had this spotless jalabi, uh, jubba. It was absolutely, you know, if it was white, it, it was stainless. And then he would have a huge overcoat on top, the Azhari Jubba, and we would see him every single day with the ulama and the shiukh in, in the masjid, whether it be in Azhar Masjid or whether it be in the university. And we would see that individual all the time. He was only, he just, it was as if he was attached to, to the ulama and he wouldn't let go. And every time I saw that individual, I thought to myself, He's one of those, the ulama, one of the shiyukh of, of Al-Azhar. I, I didn't know there's, you know, there's thousands of students in Al-Azhar. So I thought, this individual, I see him always, he's either with this shaykh or he's with that shaykh or he's with that shaykh. So he's, he's someone important, you know. He's someone who's, um, who's no doubt knowledgeable and he's a pious individual. And it, about a year later, I was sitting in, in I, I was in my third year. In, in, in university, um, doing my tachasus in, in hadith, and I got out of my classroom and I, and I walked down the corridor and I see him coming out, out of the second year classroom. And I thought he was teaching um, the, the, the class. So I naturally, you know, stood back, I opened the door for him. So, Salaamu Alaikum, Ya Shaykh, Kif Al Hal, Zayi Kamale, you know, Ya Shaykh, how are you? How are things? How was class? And he just turned around and looked at me and says, Alhamdulillah, it was okay, it went well. And he was quite shocked that I was, you know, treating him in such a way that I was opening doors for him. Well, naturally, we should do that for everybody anyway. And, you know, uh, and, I, and he, he then, then he, he, he walked further on and he just, he was just giving me this, I, I got this kind of vibe from him as if he was trying to, he was looking at me thinking, who is this guy and what is he doing? 
And um, then I walked with him and I walked behind him. And I was walking very respectfully behind him as we do with our shayuk. And, and um, this was a lesson for me also. And I was walking behind him and he turned around and he says, Eda, you know, what do you want? <laughs> and I says, Sheikh, you know, I, 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 I'd love to sit in one of your lectures sometime, you know. I'd love to, to, to learn from him. He says, I'm studying in the second <laughs> I've seen you in the third year class. You know, you can't take anything from me. That was his, uh, his humility and his humbleness, him saying that you can't take anything from me. But look at that. You know, just by associating with the ulama and being close with the scholars. And my perception of that individual was that he's a learned man. He's a learned individual. You know, if I saw that very same individual associating with a drug dealer or an alcoholic or, or anybody else, regardless of whether he was drinking or taking drugs himself, what am I going to assume? Now this individual, that's his company. So a man is known by the company that he keeps. So that's why, you know, I, I, automatically I'd never open a door for him. Mm. Now this is, this is my character. And, and, you know, that's something which is, which, you know, had a profound effect on me. Then I thought to myself, did I respect this individual? Because I thought that he, why couldn't I have respected him regardless of whether he was a scholar or not? You know, and that was kind of an eye opener for me. The way we um, uh, deal with or our conduct in regards to our brothers and sisters. And just a simple act of opening the door for somebody, look at uh, how, what kind of a profound effect that, that can have on somebody. You know, uh, you know, adopting the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, when people would travel to, from Mecca, and if they had nobody to, to go with them, he, he once came across this old woman, um, and she was sitting in, on the street with her bags. And uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam asked her, and says, you know, uh, do you have any problems? Could I assist you in any way? And she said, I, I want to travel outside Mecca, and I have nobody to take me. I have no, no, individ I have no husband, no child, nobody to, to take me uh, or go with me on my journey. And the Prophet sallallahu he, he, he was there for those individuals, for, for those people who had nothing, for those people who had nobody. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, oh, Allah, I'm here for you, you know, think of me as your son today. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa accompanies that woman. And it was a few days journey and the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam finally got to that place and he, he, he took uh, the bags and he handed them to the lady once she greeted the old woman, once he reached her destination. And she turned around and she said, you know, I wish, young man, I wish I had something to give you. I'm a poor, destitute woman. I have absolutely nothing with me to give you. I wish I did, you know, because I see you as a ragul muhtaram, as a, as a beautiful young man, someone who has beautiful manners, a beautiful character. And I wish I could give you something, but I have nothing to give you in terms of amwal, in terms of wealth. But what I can give you is some advice. And the Prophet said, what, what advice can you give me? And the old woman said, that in Mecca, there's a magician. There's a man who's he's a wizard. He's leading people away from Islam. Uh, sorry, he's leading people uh, to this new religion, Islam, and away from what our pious predecessors. To them, they were their pious predecessors, the ones who worshipped the idols. He's leading people away from that. And he's... Um, uh, you know, people are coming under his spell. And that's why I've, I've left Makkah al-Mukarrama, to get as far away from that man as I possibly can. Now, and that's the advice that I want to give you. If you go back to Makkah, beware. Make sure you stay away from that man. And the Prophet wasallam says, he then told that woman that I am that individual who you perceive to be uh, a magician, a wizard, somebody who's, who's putting spells, you know, uh, like Harry Potter on, on, on the Quraysh. Uh, and uh, that woman, uh, so she was, she was naturally, she's shocked. She thinks that this, this individual, this is the man that helped me and assisted me. This is someone who, are, a character which I've never seen before, uh, conduct which I've never come across before. And she was attracted by her and alhamdulillah she accepted Islam. Um, so that was the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to even those people who were violent towards him, abusive towards him. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he went to Ta'if. And at Ta'if what happened? He was stoned by young children 
to such an extent that blood from his head was flowing down into his sandals. You know, that's how much he was bleeding and he was hurt. Um, and, and yet when Jibreel uh, uh, came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, I've come with a command from Allah جل, that if you were to wish, if you wanted, there's two mountains on either side of Ta'if and we'll bring down such, a, such destruction upon this town that not a single one of them will be left alive. And the Prophet وسلم, said, am I not sent as mercy for mankind? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The Quran says, and we have not sent you, but as a mercy for all of mankind. And the Prophet وسلم, said, no, perhaps there's a chance that amongst their children, or their children's children, or their, you know, from amongst their lineage, there might be one individual who might accept this. The Prophet وسلم, was not a, a prophet of destruction, a prophet who came to... Uh, to uh, abuse or a prophet who came to destroy people. You know, the Prophet was one who brought people together. The Prophet ﷺ had such character and such contact with the people. Even those who were abusive and violent towards him, the Prophet ﷺ never reciprocated in the same way. Uh, and that's character, that's, that's prophetic character. And when the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Al ulama'u waratatul anbiya. That the ulama, the scholars, are the inheritors, the heirs of the prophets. <laughs> the, the, the anbiya, the prophets, they do not leave behind a single dirham or dinar in inheritance, except that they leave behind the end, knowledge. <laughs> and whoever grasps that knowledge that the Prophet <laughs> has left behind, and he's held on to something which is broad, you know, uh, something which is all encompassing. And that inheritance that the Prophet ﷺ left behind, part of that inheritance is his sunnah, adopting the character that the Prophet ﷺ had, his personality, his conduct, the way he dealt with non Muslims, the way he dealt with non Muslims. But nowadays we say, oh, well, we live in a non Muslim land. And, you know, there's, we've got restrictions upon us. Wallahi, do you have the restrictions that the, the, the Muslims had at the time of the Quraysh in Mecca? Do you have such restrictions? They, you, we have no freedom to pray. You have a beautiful, alhamdulillah, you have no restrictions. There you've got a beautiful prayer room in, in, uh, on, on campus. But the, the companions, they were not allowed to come to, to the Kaaba, to the Haram, to pray. Until Umar accepted Islam and the Muslims became 40, then, at, under the leadership of, of Umar and Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and Huma, then they came to, to the Haram to pray their Salah. You know, you've got freedom, alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in so many different ways. Um, uh, and when, you, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a blessing, and then the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fahaddith, and talk about them. Tell the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with so much. So that's the character that we need to adopt. And, uh, you know, not the character of those individuals who are going to lead you astray. Adopt the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because ultimately that is what is going to take you into Jannah. Um, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith related by Imam al-Tirmidhi, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that a person who he follows the deen of his close friend Therefore, let each and every one of you carefully look at whom he chooses as a friend. So if you associate with those people who are going to um, further you in terms of your deen, in terms of your religion, um, people who are going to have a positive impact upon you, then they're the people that you need to stick to, uh, not those who, who take you away from, uh, from the Qur'an and Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, thing that I wanted to mention that uh, I'm sure uh, perhaps is, this is not for such a congregation is the role of parents uh, and the reason why I'm telling you is because where you're all going to become parents one day you're going to have your children and inshallah your children will come to university and they will study also um, and you leave behind that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in Qatar um, uh, 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 sin, everything is cut off from a man except three things and uh, what are those three things the first is 
The second is ilbun yuntafa' bihi, any knowledge that he has left behind and people are still benefiting from. For example, if he wrote a book and people are reading that book and still being inspired, um, he's going to be benefited from that even after he has passed away. And the third is waladin salih yad'ula, or a pious child who raises his hands and prays for the forgiveness of his father. Um, so inshallah you'll have children one day who, who will be from amongst, and from amongst those pious children who will raise their hands up in prayer for their, for their parents. And the parents have a, an important role to play when you send your children to university. As many of you are, are, are aware, they, it's important that they support and um, trust their children. And uh, I'm sure our brothers and sisters here can, um, can identify with that in terms of trust and parents. They don't usually trust us too much when we come to university. Uh, it's important that, that you do, you give your children the right upbringing. And when you give them the right upbringing, then you have no fear of trusting them uh, in regards to what they do uh, further in their, in, in their lives. So we need to, we need to do that. Uh, we need to establish uh, a connection of, you know, connect our children with those individuals who are from the pious people, you know. If uh, we ourselves are not practicing Muslims, if we ourselves are never praying salah and we're, we don't know how to read the Qur'an and we're sending our children four to six every single day, weekdays, to, to, the, to the madrasa or the maktab to learn how to read the Qur'an and we don't know how to do that ourselves. So when the children come home and say, Daddy, you know, what does this say? And Dad said, didn't the Imam Sahib tell you in the masjid? I have no idea. You know, uh, we don't, they're not the parents that we should aim to be. We need to be those parents that teach and train our children uh, in regard to the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasulullah before they go to the masjid before the children go to the masjid they need to know who the Prophet was before they go to study Islamic studies they need to know what Islam is and by merely saying the kalima that's ikrar bil lisan that's just saying the kalima I can say la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I can say that but that doesn't necessarily mean, and this is a fiki issue, that doesn't necessarily mean that I become a believer straight away. You have something which is called tasdik bil janan. One is ikrar bil lisan by affirming it with the tongue, and second is tasdik bil janan. And then confirming it with your heart. You know that yes, there is no God, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. You know, then some ulama have also added a third condition that you're not, never going to be a true believer until you have something which is called amal bil arkan until you act upon the, the arkan also you act upon all the, the pillars of Islam you pray your salah, you give your zakah, you give sadaqah you give charity, you perform your hajj only then when you act upon all the arkan of Islam only then you become a true believer so you know it's uh, quite hypocritical of us to teach our or to tell our children that they need to be a certain way, they need to dress a certain way, they need to believe certain things. And yet, we don't do that ourselves. That's quite hypocritical. In the same way, if I was to stand here before you today, or sit here before you today, and say to you, that, oh, Sidi, brothers and sisters, you need to pray your salah. You have to pray your salah. And when it comes to salah time, I'm nowhere to be seen myself. You know, um, that's hypocritical of me. So, uh, you know, uh, only when you, this is what's going to have far more of an effect. I can tell you to pray your salah. I can say, brother, this is salah, this is what it means. The Prophet wasallam said, this is a mi'raj, the ascension of a believer. And you can go in through one ear and out of the other. And you listen and then you walk out and it'll completely be gone. Um, on the other hand, I can just stand up and, you know, salah time can come, I can pull out my prayer mat and put my kufi on my head and then I can pray my salah. That's going to have far more of a profound effect on you. And you're going to think to yourself, wow, you know, I'm in a state of wudu, why don't I pray as well? You know, this person has set out a perfect example from me. Um, and that's what we need to do. Um, I did want to talk about uh, the, some certain characteristics of, of what an Islamic friendship is. And, I, and I've touched upon that already in terms of, 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 the peop, of loving people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibbu li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. And none of you can truly believe until you love for your brother, what you love for yourself, 
Um, one hadith that I wanted to mention reported by Imam Ahmad in his Muslim, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that whoever would like to taste the halawat and iman, the sweetness of iman, the sweetness of belief, then let him love an individual, a person, solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Because when you love somebody solely for the sake of Allah, you associate yourself solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala, then you taste that halawat and iman, the sweetness of of, of faith. Um, and uh, what, uh, well, lastly, I, I, I wanted to talk about um, something which is equally as important and something which affects, something which is a contemporary issue, which affects all of us. Now, we're living in, uh, as a minority community in a majority non-Muslim population. Um, and you're going to encounter or interact with non-Muslims on a regular basis now. What, how, what should be our uh, conduct in regards to or in relation to, to non-Muslims? Uh, should we be, astaghfirullah, I don't want to associate with them, they're non-Muslims, this is kufr, and I want to stay away from kufr as far as I can. No. You know, that, that, that's not the prophetic inheritance that the Prophet ﷺ left behind. That's not the prophetic way that we think, no, I want to refrain from them as much as possible. No. Um, since we're going to interact with non-Muslims regularly, daily basis in universities, and colleges, and schools, at the workplace, um, it, as in society at, uh, at large, it's completely incorrect to cut ourselves completely from them and live in isolation. You know, if you were to say to yourself, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, a non-Muslim area, I want to go to a Muslim area, which, which reminds me of the, the, the recent YouTube hit, of the young brothers in uh, the young misguided brothers in, in in London who are going around terrorizing the streets and say this is a Muslim area, you know that was their that was their slogan. They were telling people that this is Sharia law is being applied in this area. This is a Muslim area, and you cannot do this. It's a big YouTube hit. You should have a look at it. Um, and you know that's not the prophetic way. You don't go around telling people this is a Muslim area and you cannot. You're allowed to live here. You. If you're a Muslim only, then you can live here, or you know you can't drink alcohol on the street, or you can't carry alcohol searching people's bags. This is not the prophetic way. Uh, this is not something which, which is going to take us closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We have to engage and interact with people, non-Muslims, just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interacted with non-Muslims in in Mecca first, i.e. the Quraysh, and when he went to Medina to Munawwara, who did he interact with? The Jews of Medina. And he had an amicable relationship with them. Um, they got along fine. Um, we need to have that, uh, that, uh, that interaction also. Um, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Islam. There's no priesthood in Islam. Uh, Islam doesn't require priests who, who, who stay celibate and, and attach themselves to the church or the masjid in our case and never leave the mosque. Or Islam doesn't require nuns who stay in the nunnery and never leave that, that place for the entirety of their lives. No, la rahbaniyata in Islam. There's no priesthood in Islam. Uh, there's a Naqshbandi Sufi principle that I want to tell, tell you about. It's, it was taught to me by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. Um, some beautiful uh, principles that they have. Uh, the first one was khush dardam, being at ease with oneself. Um, and you can only be at ease with oneself if you have a connection if you've established a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second was nazar barqadam, looking towards one's feet, which in Arabic we call ghaddul basar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us to lower our gazes. And that's a Naqshbandi Sufi principle. Um, and the third one, which, which is in relation to this, living with, with Muslims and non-Muslims alike, khalwat dar anjuman. And in Arabic, literally, it's al khalwa. Uh, al fil jalwa, um, being alone and isolated in a crowd. Khalwa dar anjuman, so you being alone and unique in a crowd. So that's the most important thing. Here, the, this is a Sufi way that in order for you to establish a connection with 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 Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you have to be alone in a crowd. What does it mean to be alone in a crowd? It means that you be part of that crowd. You bring people towards Islam, but you're unique in your own way that you focus upon your connection. Everything around you, that crowd, every single person around you helps you 
assists you in establishing your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's being alone in the crowd. Not completely isolating yourself and saying, okay, I'm going to stay in my home and I'm never going to go out and interact with, with non-Muslims. That's not the prophetic way. Um, and we have to refrain from that. Um, lastly, um, what I wanted to, to, to talk about is, um, is valuing your youth. The Prophet ﷺ has told us the value, the time that we have. Um, when this time passes, you know when we're here in university, you, we don't realize um, you know, the, the, uh, that we're going to regret this time if I didn't put it to, to use. We don't think to ourselves, well, you know, I've got two hours, what should I do? Should I read some Quran? Should I study? Or, or you know, is it Thursday night? You know, uh, let's go out, you know? Uh, and that's, that's what you're going to regret afterwards. You're going to think to yourself, you know, those two hours I had on that Thursday night, you know, I could have done so much better. I could have, you know, uh, done something which, which uh, or I could have performed an action which was more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, than what I actually did. And um, that's why the Prophet sallallahu said that value five things before those five things are taken away from you. And uh, the first one was youth. Value your youth before old age. Because when it comes to, to old age, I, I have, alhamdulillah, my grandparents have passed away, rahimahumullah, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them. Mm-hmm. But what, they, what do they always say when they look at you and say, oh, you've got it easy, you've had it easy, you know, we've had, we had to do this and work with our own hands. And, and also, what else do they say? Value it. You don't know what you're, you know, this time we wish we could go back. Later shababa yaud. You know, in Arabic, you know, if only youth would return. You know, that's what, when you, when you grow older, that's all you think about. And if only I was young again, I would live my life differently, I would do something differently. And we are young, alhamdulillah. Um, and we need to value our youth before this uh, is taken away from us. And now, I, how long have I got left? I said, 15 minutes, okay, um, 15 minutes. I don't want to take up too much of your time now. The last 10 or 50, 10, 50, 10 minutes I want to focus on um, something which I've seen in universities um, and university students. Um, is this uh, the double lives that some of us, we live, our university brothers and sisters, we live this double life. And what is this double life? Um, this double life is weekdays uh, coming to university, uh, uh, chilling out, uh, going clubbing, you know, getting, indulging in all sorts of, of, of haram, prohibited acts, and then weekend it's time to go home, and for the brothers it's, you know, get rid of all the smells and, you know, you know uh, nice enough, and freshen up and, and go home and, and be that obedient son and for our sisters is, you know, on the other hand, you know, we're going back home to, to uh, to our parents and our families, we can't do those things that we were doing in you know, university, and suddenly it's being an obedient daughter uh, is the main uh, emphasis is, is on that. And we sort of live this double life that when we're in university is completely different, and outside university when we're back home is completely different. Now we need to bridge that gap right there. Um, the same way would you stay at home with your family, the conduct, that you have with them, that's exactly the same way that you should be in university. You know, if you're at home and you're being the obedient son to your, or the obedient daughter to your parents, then be that obedient servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're, in, uh, when you're at university. And that's the most important thing. Um, I did tell you of, of the sister who I, who, who I came across, and the, the brother who I came across. There was a, there was a sister who I was recently reading about, and, by in who was it? I can't remember on some some website, Haq Islam or something. Um, I don't know whether it was authentic or not, but Khair, um, I can mention uh, the story. It was a story of, of a sister who who came from this typical um, uh, hedonistic uh, lifestyle of a British undergraduate student. You know, she she says that I was um, when I was at home, I used to wear my hijab, and uh, I was obedient to my family, I would, I would stay at home, I wouldn't go out during the weekends. Is it, is it a last time already? Yeah. Yeah. It's an okay. so, Allahu Akbar.
And that's uh, the brother's phone reminding us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great. Allah, may Allah bless you. Um, the, the sister, she was, she, she had that typical lifestyle. And she was, when she was at home, she says in her own words that I used to wear the hijab and I used to dress modestly. And um, then go out and, and, and uh, uh, go clubbing, I would drink and I would, uh, I would take drugs and, and, and so forth. And what she says, her excuse, it baffled me. The excuse was, well, and this is the excuse of most of our brothers and sisters who are doing this, who are doing And they're, they're, very, they're the minority of students who, who are doing this. But nonetheless, it's something, an issue that needs to be tackled and something that needs to be touched upon. She says, I was experimenting. That's what she says. She says, I was experimenting. And since we're only here, for a short period of time, I wanted to do as much as I can, so that once this time is over, then I won't regret it. And in her mind, in her mind, she thinks she's going to regret not taking full value of this time in terms of going clubbing and drinking alcohol and taking drugs. That's what she's not going. If she didn't do that, she would have regretted it. But obviously, she uh, it's it's the other way around. Naturally, you ask every, any individual who has indulged in such acts in university, they think to themselves, if only I'd, I'd focused more time and effort to my studies, I wouldn't have, I shouldn't have done this. Um, and and that, was, that was baffling to me, that experimenting. University isn't for tajriba. You know, tajriba is a part of, of learning, is a part of ilm, of knowledge. Tajriba means to exper experience or experiment. Um, you're here to learn. We're not here to experiment, you know, uh, experiment with different things. Just take the knowledge, take... Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, al kalimat al hikmat al mu'min That the, a wise word is a lost treasure of a believer. فَحَيْتُ وَجَدَهَا فَهُوَ أَخْقُبِهَا And so wherever he should find that wise word, then he is the most entitled to it. So the Muslim, a Muslim believer, a mu'mina, or a mu'min, is entitled to that wise word. He, he's the most, he or she is the most entitled to it. And that's, what, that's how we need to be. And that's how we need to, to live our life. Everything that we need to do is, is, is always going to be in the sunnah of Rasulullah And not to merely experiment and have some fun and go home and then say, okay, you know what, we've got the rest of our lives to, to, um, <coughs> to study Islam, or we've got the rest of our lives to implement Islam within our own lives. That's not uh, the correct way. Prophet that's the reason why he said, take, you, take advantage of your youth before your old age comes. And who knows? Who knows that, that you, the old age will even come to us? We, we'll, all, we'll have that. We'll experience old age. You, you never know. Kullu nafsin ikatul mawt. Every soul shall taste death. But the time of death, no individual knows. No one knows that this is the time of my death, or I'm going to die at this time. Nobody knows. So prepare for it. Prepare for and, and the reason why I say prepare for life, prepare for death by living your life in, according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasulullah That is your preparation for death. Living your life according to the teachings of the, the Prophet ﷺ, according to the teachings of Islam and the Qur'an. Um, so... Uh, Put the, the fun and games and the pleasure to one side and uh, focus on, on, on what you're here to do, uh, what you're here, what you want to achieve, because um, that's, that's your goal, that's your destination, and map out your destination in front of you. You, know, um, you don't need to pull out the big book for, uh, of maps. You know, nowadays, you just have little tom-toms, you can just put the address in and you're straight there, there's your destination. You know, map out your destination in your mind. Uh, this is what I aim to be. This is what I aim to achieve in five years or ten years time and work towards that goal and when you work towards that goal um, of what you aspire to be uh, map it out according to the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet no, that I won't do anything which is against the Quran I won't do anything which is against Islam to reach my destination that's, your, that's not your true destination then if it's not according to Islam so everything that you do has to be according to Islam, has to be according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Lastly, and a few final points before I hand it over.
um, and conclusively uh, just go over the main points again that, that renew your intention. If your intention wasn't sincere before, if it wasn't pure before, make sure it, it is now. Renew it and always keep renewing your intention. That I'm here solely for the sake of Allah and for the sake of the Prophet I'm, so, I'm here solely for the sake of Islam. Uh, and keep renewing that intention. Um, don't listen to those people who want you to fail. You know, in that you have um, those people who want you to fail or those people who want you to cheat. And people, you don't want to take you away from, don't study brother, sister, let's go out tonight. You know, they're the people who want you to, to fail. What, I was talking to one of my lecturers in, in Cambridge and he said to me that one of the main problems, this is in the first week that I was in Cambridge, one of the main problems that university students face or what we are faced with when, when we have our, uh, for our batch of students in the university is what? Plagiarism. So plagiarism is the number one problem for all students that we have to face, we have to come across. And uh, I, you, I, I don't know whether he was warning me, or, or I, I think he was. And make sure your, your essays, and none of them are plagiarized or, or something like that. So, you know, let's not allow ourselves to be cheated because when we, when we do something like this, we're only cheating ourselves. We're, che we're cheating our faith, our iman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a sadiq and I mean the most truthful, the most trustworthy individual. Never did he cheat a single individual, never did he cheat anyone. And, and we Muslims, we need to be at the forefront of honesty and integrity. Uh, and that's the most important thing. Respect your teachers. You know, that's something which we don't see too much in, or too often in, in the UK. Respect your teachers, respect your university, respect your campus. Like I said, even removing harm from, from the corridor is a part of faith, it's a branch of faith. Uh, and, and, and make sure you do that. Um, and try to be presentable. And by being presentable, it's not only the clothes that you wear that have to be presentable and in all aspects of haya and, and, and modesty. Make sure your speech is respect, respectable too. That when you talk or converse with non-Muslims and non-Muslims alike, make sure it's, it's with, with the kalam which is fasi, which word, with words which are beautiful and easy on the, hit, on the ear. Not, you know, um, kalam which is, you know, ghair fasi and which is... Uh, you know, which is full of hate and uh, words which are full of, um, you know, the you're going to Jahannam, uh, you're going to hell uh, rhetoric. You know, that's not something that we, you need to, to indulge in. And, and lastly, um, and, and last but not least, you need to choose your friends carefully. And those individuals that you choose, make sure those, the, the people that you hang around with, the people that you associate with, um, they're the people who are going to help you who will assist you in establishing this connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the Qur'an, with Islam, and not those who are going to try and take you away from that. Jazakumullah khair, and wa'akul ta'awana, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamd